Hey students, let's get started with the chapter on probability. Probability is the mathematical study of randomness and uncertain outcomes. So the subject, in fact, may be about as old as calculus. At some level, humans have known about probability for a very long time. It's just it wasn't until around the time of probability that we saw some of the first uh, semi-rigorous treatments of probability and then probability really became a serious mathematical subject around uh, the beginning of the 20th, 20th century uh, when a mathematician by the name of Kolmogorov uh, rooted probability theory in, in, uh, in some real analysis theory. So he developed a set of axioms that made it a rigorous uh, mathematical subject in its own right, and here we are today. And statistics relies very heavily on probability. We've seen in the previous chapter quantities such as the mean and the median. Uh, we saw all these sample statistics. We discussed the ideas of a sample and a sample's relationship to a population. But it's hard, you can't really say much more than that and really can't have a rigorous discussion about different uh, sample statistics without having a probability theory to back it up. So we're going to start with that right now. We're going to start with section one on sample spaces and events. So we start out with the idea of an experiment. An experiment is an activity or process with an uncertain outcome. Examples of experiments including flipping a coin or flipping a coin until the coin lands heads up or you can have rolling a die. Um, a six-sided die <coughs> or a rolling two six-sided die uh, or you could even have uh, something a bit more abstract such as uh, the time in the morning that you wake up that can also be understood via probability theory uh, so when we have an experiment that we have described narratively in a sense so I say I'm going to flip a coin or I go in to flip a coin until it lands heads up. After we have an experiment, we need to describe the sample space, which we are going to denote in this class with the letter S, although I should point out that, at least in my experience, omega, the Greek letter omega, is <coughs> more common um, notation for the sample space. Um, but this is fine. Uh, S is fine. Um, so this will be... The sample space is the set of all possible outcomes of the experiment. The sample space is defined by the person who's uh, developing this probability model. Uh, so it basically you say what the sample space is, and you're going to pick a sample space that seems appropriate to the phenomena that you wish to describe. A set is very loosely defined as a collection of, ob uh, of objects uh, actually, this definition of set is bad um, because it's possible using just the idea of a collection of objects to construct impossible sets. Uh, sets that are like in, impossible in the sense of being contradictory to itself. So uh, there's this uh, area of mathematics called axiomatic set theory that actually develops a rigorous notion of sets that largely allows for sets that we'd like to think of. But honestly... Uh, for our purposes, this is this is definitely overkill. Uh, just thinking of set as a collection of objects is uh, fine for us. Uh, events are subsets of the sample space, uh, defining possible outcomes of an experiment. We automatically get an event called, or a subset called the empty set, or the null event, uh, which is denoted with this notation. This is a set with no members, it can be thought of as an event, of as the event where nothing happens. And that is precisely how you should think about it. I might uh, create a separate video describing w what precisely the empty set is and kind of try to dispel some inclinations of students to try to assign some deeper meaning to what to the empty set. It's like, no, no, no. The empty set is a set with nothing in it, and you really cannot call it anything else. It's more... Uh, a necessity of the mathematics than it is anything that you can honestly interpret. So uh, let's get started. 
uh, with an example. We're going to define a sample space for the experiment of flipping a coin. We're going to list all possible events for this experiment. Let me just get caught up in my notes uh, that I have aside here. And uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to say uh, that this sample space, uh, which I'm going to call S, uh, what are going to be the possible outcomes of flipping a coin? Well, uh, despite what might be physically possible, like I actually have seen coins, uh, not not necessarily like mint coins, uh, but things very coin-like that end up landing on their side, but that is not going to be allowed here. There's only two possible outcomes, heads and tails. And notice that, notice the curly braces, often sets, what we are talking about is a set, Generally, sets are going to be uh, denoted with uh, curly braces. Another important fact about sets is that the objects in sets only appear uh, once generally. If you were, so like for example, this set is the same as H, H, uh, T. So at, at, at some level, there's uniqueness in a set. You get imposed uniqueness. So if you list heads twice, it's the same set. Okay? Um... And additionally, the ordering of how I write stuff down in a set does not matter. So I could have written tails heads and it would have been the exact same set here. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, now we have the sample space and this is what it is by definition. I decided this is the sample space for my experiment. And I decided this because I believe that this sample space is going to be the appropriate sample space uh, for my problem. So I'm saying that there's two possible outcomes of this experiment. You, the coin either lands heads up or it lands tails up. Uh, and I, so next I'm going to list some possible events for this experiment. So an event is a subset of the sample space. Okay, so what is one possible subset? Uh, well, one possible subset is the set that contains only H. Right, so only heads. So this is the event or the subset where when you flip the coin, it lands heads up. And similarly, we have the event where it lands tails up. And some authors like to call um, sets like these sets with only one element, simple events, because they have uh, only one outcome. Even Komogorov in his book on probability theory uh, denoted... Uh, uh, had the notion of simple events where it has only one outcome corresponding to something that you would actually observe. Um, uh, I, I, I personally don't really care for the distinction myself, uh, but students might like it. Uh, we can also have the event heads or tails. So what's a, what is a possible outcome for this? Well, we could get heads or tails, basically. Um, and notice right here that this is the same as the sample space. So I could have said the sample space is an event. And generally that's true because what does it mean for a set to be a subset of another set? What does it mean for, for something to be a subset? It means that every element in a set is present in another set or equivalently there are no elements in the subset that are not present in, let's call it, the parent set, right? So equivalently, you cannot find an element in the subset that isn't present in this uh, containing set, okay? So by that definition, the sample space is a subset of itself since every element in the sample space is also present in the sample space, so it's, it seems almost tautologically true. And yet, at the same time, it matters. It matters a great deal that one set that you automatically get when you, def one event that you automatically get when you define a sample space is the sample space itself. And there is one more event that we have the moment we define the sample space, the empty set. That is also a subset of the sample space. Now it seems really weird because you ask yourself, how is it that a set with nothing in it, another way to write the sample space is 
like this, where you write two curly braces but with nothing in between them because the set empty set has nothing in it. Okay? Um, so you ask yourself, how is it that the sample space, every element of the sample space is also, no, every element of the empty set is also in the sample space? It, it has no elements. Well, exactly. Because by this alternative de way to think about what it takes to be a subset, there is nothing in the empty set that isn't present in the sample space because there's nothing in the empty set. Therefore, you automatically get that you automatically get that the empty set is a subset of the sample space and therefore the empty space is an event. Now, I I I'm kind of implying here that what it takes for something to be an event is that this set needs to be a subset of the sample space. So in other words, what it takes to be an event is that you simply be a subset of the sample space. Technically, that is not true. But the reason why it's not true is going well beyond the scope of this class. And uh, you might see a little bit of it in probability theory. And it would become much more important if you were to take graduate level probability theory, measure theoretic probability theory. Technically, it is not true that every subset um, of the sample space is an event. That said, it's really hard to imagine a subset that isn't one. So basically, if you imagine the subset and you didn't actually try to break the theory, if you imagine a subset, it's probably an event. So uh, it's for now, it's probably fine, although I'll probably add a little more rigor to the notion of what it takes to be an event. Um, or do I do that only in like a class devoted to probability theory. I'm not really sure if I talk about it in this class. Um, we'll see. We'll see. We'll have to see as you go through the notes. All right. Uh, so that's that. Um, by the way, I should probably uh, mention something. Uh, here, we might give names to these events. Like we might call this first event EH. We might call this second uh, simple event ET. Uh, to say that one subs one set is a subset of another, we can use the notation, say, uh, EH uh, is a subset. Uh, and I like to put a line underneath. Um, so to say that it could possibly be the same as uh, the sample space. So we have this, or, eh, I mean, a lot of people also will just write it like this. Uh, so we set have that the event EH is a subset of the sample space ET is a subset of the sample space. Um, S is a subset of itself. And the empty set is a subset of the sample space. Okay. So, uh, continuing on. Next example. Define a sample space for the experiment of rolling a six-sided die. List three events uh, based on this sample space. Okay, so I'm going to say, because I think this is the best way to understand this problem, uh, that it's going to consist of <coughs> outcomes uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but I'm not going to write the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I have, and I have reasons for not writing the numbers. The reason is there is nothing in probability theory that requires that your sets contain numbers. Nothing says that. It just says some object very loosely defined. So instead of writing numbers... I'm going to write little dice faces. So I have a dice face that has one pip, a dice face that has two pips, a dice face that has three pips, a dice face that has four pips, a dice face that has five pips, and finally, a dice face that has six pips. Okay, that, that looks like six pips. All right, so that's my sample space. And now I'm going to list three events based on this sample space. So one event, uh, one event is the empty set. I'm just gonna say it right now. The empty set is this subset. So here we go, we get one, we get a one event for free. Eh, I, I've promised myself I'm not gonna do that here. <laughs> that's my preferred notation. I'm not sure if it's the notation used in the book and not everybody uses the same notation. That's something that you need to get used to in mathematics you need to pay attention to what notation someone is using because despite the fact that the books and sometimes the instructors make it look like there's one set of notation, 
uh, for uh, a subject. That's just not true. And that's, in- and that's including probability theory and statistics. It's just not true that there is one set of notation. And you need to pay attention to what someone is actually using to mean their stuff. Um, anyway, um, uh, so the empty set is a subset of the sample space. The sample space is a subset of the sample space. Both of these are uh, valid events. Okay, but they're almost trivial at this point because these are events that you automatically get. So what's something that's a little bit more interesting? Uh, well, we could have the event where you roll a four. Uh, this is one of those simple events that you may have heard of. So four is an event and it's a subset of the sample space. Uh, what's another one that we could have? Well, we could have the event where uh, you have an even number of pips. That's a valid event uh, because, in fact, even though I've written this down in English, and often it's useful to write down sets in English sentences, what this actually translates into is a set with three elements. You have the set containing the dice with uh, with two pips on its face, uh, four pips on its face, and six pips on its face. These are all... Uh, come on, you. Come on, I said six pips. Don't make me a fool, you stupid laptop. <sighs> Some people. There we go. So this is also a subset of the sample space. This is also an event. Um, okay. So, um, there we go. I've, I've given you four events, in fact. Uh, so you got a little bit more than what you paid for. Anyway, uh, example three, define a sample space describing the event, uh, the experiment of flipping a coin until it lands heads up. List five events from this sample space. Ooh. So what does this look like? What does this look like? Well, I'm going to say here's my sample space. And, uh, well, what's one possibility? Uh, flip a coin until it lands heads up. Well, it could land heads on the first flip. So you flip the coin, it lands heads, and then you stop. Uh, you could then, fl- you could, another outcome is you flip the coin and it lands tails. So you haven't gotten heads yet, so you need to flip it again, and then it lands up heads the second time. So tails heads is another possible possibility. Uh, tails tails heads is a third possibility. Tails 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 heads is yet another possibility, and so on. This set has an infinite number of elements because, in principle, if I have um, if I have an outcome where uh, it, where you've got so many tails and the last one is a head, it's possible to also have an outcome where you where in order where before you got to that point you flipped the coin and you got tails once. So for every outcome, you can find a next outcome in a sense. So since there's always going to be a next outcome, this set must have an infinite number of members. Now, there is actually an interesting wrinkle that com- that came up in uh, one of my lectures on this. Is there an outcome in this sample space that corresponds to flipping the coin and it never comes up with heads? The answer is no. The answer is, in this probability model, it is impossible for the coin to land, uh, to never get heads. Because I never described an element in this sample space where the coin just, where you just flip the coin forever because you never get heads. It is explicitly forbidden in this probability model since you cannot find an outcome corresponding to it. So therefore, since there is no such outcome where the coin never, where the where you never stop flipping the coin, it is literally impossible in this probability model. It's a very subtle point. It seems like you should have that outcome in this, but in fact, you don't. Um, it, it it's just the, and the reason why being I didn't define this sample space to allow for that possibility. Since there isn't a possibility that corresponds to it, it simply doesn't exist, right? Although it seems a little unfair because we can imagine a universe in which someone flips a coin and they never get tails for, and they never get heads forever. It does seem like it's a possibility, but it is explicitly forbidden in this probability model since it is not in the universe of possibilities. 
Um, and by the way, it is different from something being impossible and improbable. Improbable would probably mean uh, when you define a probability model for this, the probability of something happening is zero, which seems realistic to say for flipping a coin until it, uh, uh, where you flip a coin forever and uh, you never get heads. It seems like it's reasonable to say it's improbable, but not impossible. But right now it is literally impossible since there is no outcome that corresponds to that. Um, we would have to add a separate element, um, which if we really wanted to, um, we could add maybe the infinity element to our probability model to represent the outcome where you flip the coin forever. Um, and by the way, none of this says anything about what the probability of these events or these outcomes are. I have no notion of probability at this point. This is all set theory, right? So it seems like you would say that the probability that you flip the coin forever is zero, but I have, I have said nothing about probability so far. Now that said, that is a complication that we are going to leave out. We are not going to consider it any further. Uh, we are just going to stick with this probability model. Uh, maybe I would revisit uh, this notion of flipping the coin forever uh, in a later lecture, but that, that's it for now. Uh, let's list five events from this sample space. Well, what's one event? One event is the, what is the empty set. Why don't I listen to that? Because I'm bored. Well, no, not because I'm bored, because I'm lazy. Um, another one is, um, let's say uh, you've you can maybe flip the coin exactly three times that were that would correspond to tails tails heads okay this is a possible event um that seems almost like a triviality we could have the event where you flip the coin um at uh, at most f let's say three times because i don't want to write too much all right at most three times so at most three flips, what would this correspond to? Like this is in words, but in fact, I can translate in that into a collection of outcomes. Well, you could have flipped the coin only once. That's at, that's that's no more than three. Uh, you could have flipped twice. That's no more than three. But if you flip twice, then that means that the first flip was tails. And uh, if you flip three times exactly, then you got two tails and a head. So we could have tails, tails, heads. And this would be the event. Uh, what's another event? We could say, um, well, another possible event would be, uh, in words, um, at least uh, three flips. That seems reasonable. What would that translate into? That would be the event where you flip it three times because it's at least three flips. So tails, tails, heads. And uh, tails, 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 heads has at least three flips since it has four flips. And tails, 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 heads has uh, five flips, so that counts. And in fact, there's an infinite number of such flips. Okay. Uh, and one final... Uh, possibility is an even number of flips. That's that's possible. What would that look like if we were actually using the elements uh, of the uh, set to describe it? That would be the event where you have tails heads. That has an even number of flips since it has two. Tails, tails, tails heads has an even number of flips. Uh, tails, 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 heads. Uh, that also counts since it has six flips and so on. This event also has an infinite number of outcomes. So you can see here, it's perfectly possible to talk about a probability model that has an infinite number of outcomes. Um, in fact, such models are quite common. Uh, and in fact, this particular model where I'm flipping a coin until I get heads as an, as an instructor, I really like this model because... Uh, it's it's um it's not too difficult, at least in my opinion, to understand what is going on. The idea of flipping a coin until you get heads, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to think about. And yet at the same time, despite its apparent simplicity, it is actually a quite rich probability model. 
and makes a lot of points about probability theory. So I'll probably be revisiting this one. It, it, it like it's it's simple, but it can very easily um, get out of hand in a way. Uh, you, you you can start. It, it can get quite complicated when you start analyzing it uh, probabilistically. And the mathematics themselves, like uh, a um, like students at this level, can understand it, but it's also starting to push their knowledge a little bit. And it starts requiring some trickier uh, uh, calculations to do. All right, I'm just going to check something. Uh, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, we're still streaming. Okay. All right. Uh, example four. Define a sample space describing the experiment of rolling two six-sided die simultaneously. List three events from this sample space. Uh, all right. Two six-sided die simultaneously. What would that look like? Well, it's tempting to say that this sample space consists of the numbers 2 through 12, but that's actually not what we should use. The reason why is probably what you're thinking is I'm adding the two the pips on the two dice together, but I never said that. I never said that there was going to be um, addition of two pips, so we're not going to do that. Uh, because you can define a number of uh, uh, potential outcomes, like maybe instead of uh, combining the two pips together, you're taking the larger of the two pips, something like that, um, or the smaller of the two pips. So we don't want to define our, our, our sample space that way. Um, what, what's another thing that we probably should do? Well, when developing such a probability model, it's generally better to imagine that you are actually rolling two distinct dice reason why is because when you think of it that way, you end up with more appropriate mathematics. So it's actually better to think of this sample space. Uh, ugh, I keep doing that. It's better to keep. Uh, it's better to think of this sample space as consisting of rolling a red die and a blue die. So that's what we're going to do. And just uh, to just for my own sanity, I try to draw things out as a table. So as an example, we have a blue die, or we'll call it the left die. Uh, and we have a red die. So we have an outcome where the blue die comes up with a 1 and the red die comes up with a 2. We can also have an outcome where the blue die comes up with a 1 and the red die comes up with a 2. I think I might have said the wrong thing a second ago, but whatever. And we can have an outcome where the blue die comes up with a 1 and the red die comes up with a 3. And we would continue on with this. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to list out everything because I got better ways to spend my day. Uh, I'm going to say that in this first row, uh, the last element is where the blue die comes up with the one, and the red die comes up uh, with a six. All right. Uh, so for the next row, in the next row, we'll have uh, the blue die comes up with a two. And the red die comes up with a one. Uh, so we'll just say that uh, everything in the blue uh, second row, the, the blue die will be a two. So we'll just start out uh, listing some of those outcomes. And then let's, uh, and in the third row, the blue die will be uh, three. And we in our very last row, we would have the blue die is a six. So six, uh, six, uh, six, and finally six. All right, so I probably st should still write down my red die. So I'm going to write down my red die. Uh, so we got one and one, uh, two, two, uh, two, uh, three. <coughs> Excuse me, I have somewhat of a cough. Three, three, and uh, six. Ugh. Ah, you failure. You failure of a computer. So six. 
six and finally six. Ah, for goodness sakes. Like I said, really cheap computer. Uh, six. All right, there we go. I'm satisfied. And uh, we'll just kind of tidy stuff up, put some ellipses. Um, I like things to be rather organized. And while we're at it, we'll put some commas too. Although I, at this point, I'm not really sure if the commas matter all that much. But this is a set. This is containing a bunch of stuff. This is what our set contains. Um, so just a, so how many how many how many elements are in this set? Um, well, this set contains thirty six elements since you have six possibilities for the blue dice and six possibilities for the red dice. So there's thirty six things in this uh, sample space, which using it this way comes up with more appropriate probability models because this is a, would be a model where uh, if you were thinking about adding up the dice, uh, a sum of two would be less likely than a sum of three because there's three ways to get the dice to add up to three, but only... No, there's two ways to get the dice to add up to three, but there's only one way for the dice to add up to two. Uh, so, and that's, and that's more appropriate for our probability model. And we can start listing some events from this sample space. I'm going to list one event... Uh, one one event from this sample space, uh, and it will be the empty set because I'm 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 tired. Uh, e two another uh, event would be the sample space itself. So anything happens, uh, again I'm just really lazy right now. All right, now I actually have to start writing down some real events. Well, I mean those were real events, but uh, something that's a bit more interesting. Um, let's see E three. What could we do for E three? Well. Uh, we do have the outcome where we roll um, six for the blue die and uh, uh, one for the red die. Why? Why? Why this event? Because why not this event? It is an event. Uh, what's a fourth event? Let's let's start to get a little bit more creative. We'll say that the fourth event will be um, an even number of total pips. Total suggesting that you're adding the pips together. So, all right, so let's uh, translate this into something a little bit more mathy. So you can have, let's see, uh, there's a whole bunch of outcomes for one where you could have, uh, uh, let's say that the, uh, oops, uh, all right, we could say that the blue dice is a one and what's one outcome? We have the red dice also be one. Uh, we could have the blue dice be one and the red dice be three. That has an even number of total pips. We can just keep going on with this. I'm not really sure off the top of my head. I could compute it, but I'm not really sure off the top of my head how many outcomes, uh, how many how many outcomes are actually in this uh, sample space. But it seems like it's going to be a number, and uh, I'm tired. And I'm sure you don't want me, want to watch me just list out stuff. So. Uh, we'll just end this with uh, six and six. So, because at this point you probably get the idea. Plus, I also don't honestly remember the last time anyone asked for this type of this type of event. Uh, another of so we could have for our fifth event um, that the die add up to seven. All right, so what would be in this event? Well, uh, we could have that the blue dice is one, and if the blue dice is one, since they have to add up to seven, that means that the red dice is going to be six. Uh, what's another possible outcome? Well, you could have that the blue dice is two, and since the, the oh no, they don't add up to six, they add up to seven. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you could have that the blue dice is two, in which case the red dice must be five. Uh, you can have the blue dice be three, in which case the red dice uh, must be must be four, and you keep going on like this 
uh, until eventually uh, you get to the very uh, last element that if you were to continue writing down, uh, you would write down that element being when the blue dice is six and the red dice is one. So how many elements are going to be in this uh, event? Well, it seems like for every blue die, there's a corresponding for every blue outcome between one and six, there's a corresponding red outcome that would lead to the dice adding up to uh, adding up to seven. So there must be six things in this event. So, yes. Um, by the way, for whatever for for what it's worth, I'm not sure if I mentioned this later, but I'll just mention it now. Uh, we often use this notation, uh, like for example, uh, this. We would put a set in between two what almost look like absolute value lines to mean the size of a set or more technically the cardinality of a set. But for now, when we're talking about um, uh, finite sets, it's fine to talk about, uh, to say the size of a set, meaning the number of elements in that set, in which case the size of the sample space is 36. The size of the empty set, the set with nothing in it, since there's nothing in it, its size is zero. Uh, the size of um, E5, would be six. There's six elements in E5, and there's uh, one element in E3. Okay, continuing on, uh, our next example, define a sample space describing the experiment of waking up in the morning at a particular time, where the time you wake up at, the thought of as a real number, and that's a critical point, is the outcome of interest list three events from this sample space. Um, I'm going to say that the sample space, so we can think of it in terms of hours in a day, but we're going to allow hours to be decimal points. So an hour and a half would be 1.5. So we would say that uh, midnight corresponds to zero hours. And we're just going to say that you cannot reach the midnight of the next day so maybe you've seen this notation before when regarding uh, intervals of the real line where a square bracket means that that number on that side is being included in the set and an open bracket or a parentheses on a side means that that number is not being included in that event. Uh, so some more notation. We, set, uh, we use uh, what almost looks like an E or an epsilon to say that something is a member of a set. So for example, zero is an element of the sample space. Uh, 12 is an element of the sample space, um, but 24, uh, well, let's, let, let's uh, come back to 24 in a second. 50 is certainly not an element of the sample space, so we'll put a slash in that. Uh, and 24 is not an element of the sample space either because I put an open what I call an open bracket or a parenthesis around the 24. Uh, so in this uh, alternate, so if I were thinking of 0, 24 as a set, uh, this would be a set that doesn't include 0 either. Alternatively, uh, just getting you more familiar with this notation, uh, we could describe a set that includes both of its endpoints, 0 and 24. And by the way, all of these are corresponding, oh, go away. All of these, by the way, are corresponding to uh, intervals of the real line. So some, some interval of the real line. Uh, hopefully you're somewhat familiar with that notation. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, continuing on, this is our sample space. Let's uh, erase all this stuff because this is somewhat of an aside. Um, uh, okay, do, 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 do. okay. Uh, so uh, three events from this sample space. We could have an event where um, uh, we wake up at noon. So that would probably correspond uh, to the outcome where you wake up 12 hours from midnight. Um, so this would be exactly 12 hours, though. Exactly 12. Not a second more, not a millisecond more, not a millisecond less, and not a second less. Exactly 12 hours later. Which, you think of that, that matters. It is exactly 12 and nothing, it, it seems like, like, like our, our own intuition of the world is 
Like, if you wake up a millisecond after mi- after noon, um, you still woke up at noon. It's like, no, that is not what I mean right here. So it is a precise number. And that precision should lead you to think, well, that's impossible. It's, it's Im- or, or maybe not impossible, but, but really, 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 really hard to the point of being almost impossible. And that is true. When we develop for a probability model for this experiment, we would probably assign a probability of zero to the event of waking up exactly 12 hours from midnight. Which is kind of a strange idea, but I'm going to talk about that in a later video. Just understand that, just to understand what exactly I'm saying here. Uh, let's uh, come up with another event. Uh, this event corresponds to waking up between... Um, let's say instead that you wake up sometime between 8 and 12 hours. Now, uh, my language is a little imprecise here. So I need to specify, do I mean uh, including 8 hours? Uh, including exactly 8 hours? Um, or am I saying more than 8 hours? So 8 hours in a millisecond is okay, but 8 hours on the nose is wrong. Uh, so we'll just say that we're going to exclude those endpoints. Why? Because I said so. Um, so this, excuse me, uh, this uh, this event uh, would be an event where uh, you do, in fact, uh, where you're where, where you can wake up um, eight hours in a millisecond, eight hours in a second, or twelve hours less a second. Uh, but you cannot wake up at exactly 8 hours or exactly 12 hours and be- have this event actually have occurred. Okay. Um, let's say for a third event, um, we're going to wake up. Um, let's say that it, that this is a waking up after 3 a.m. So, or um, let's see. Uh Maybe no earlier than 3 a.m. Uh, 3 so no earlier than 3 a.m. Uh, that suggests that we should include 3 a.m. in this in this uh, in this event. So uh, so we should include 3 a.m. or three hours past midnight. But all right. So what should the endpoint on the other end be? It seems like we can wake up any time after 3 a.m. and that's fine. So we're going to end at 24 since that's the last. Uh, so since those points are the last ones in this sample space. Okay. Let me get caught up. All right, moving on. Uh, events. Once we have some events, we can start uh, manipulating these events in ways that create new events. Uh, so we can start... Uh, giving some uh, operations on our set theory. So, for example, let's just say that A and B are events. Uh, and events in this situation, they're also synonymous with sets. So anything you know about set theory, uh, that, uh, you can import that here. I am act- When I'm talking about events, I'm really talking about sets. They're, those two terms in this class are used almost interchangeably. So the complement of A, uh, which in this class we're denoting with A... Oops. Uh, in this class, we're denoting with a prime, but that's not the only notation. There's a bar or a complement. This is actually my preferred notation. Uh, that's, but anyway, uh, in this class, we're going to use a prime. This is the set of outcomes of S, the sample space, not in uh, the event A. Uh, so it's all outcomes that could possibly happen that are not in A, which so in the, in fact we the 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 English words that we use for this event is not A. That's that's a perfectly way to describe it. There's the union of two sets, uh, which we would say A union B, but I also like to just say A or B since this corresponds to the logical notion of or where something in one event could happen or something in another event could happen. And by the way, when we're using or in this context, we're using it in the logical sense where um, we can have an outcome in, in A only would count as happening in A or B. An outcome in B only would ha- a, a, a count as ha- having occurred in the event A or B. And an outcome that is both in A and in B 
counts as happening in the event A or B. Which is a little bit different from how the word or is used in English because it's quite often the case in English that or means exclusively or, or exclusive or, where you can say you can have your, your cake or eat it. And like in that, in, so the phrase have your cake or eat it, it suggests that you can either have your cake or you can eat it, but you can't have both. Right. If you, there was actually, a, it was actually a really long time until that phrase made sense. So. Uh, this might actually be something for um, people whose uh, native language is not English. Uh, what they mean by have your cake and eat it too. Um, you can have your cake in your hand or you can eat your cake. But if you eat your cake, it is no longer in your hand. So that's what it means. All right. So just in case, uh, I think that that might be something that for non-native speakers, it's actually worth it to make that clarification. But for a long time, I also, as someone who's spoken English all their life, and was on the debate team and on the literary magazine did not get anyway <laughs> um uh the intersection of two sets a and b or a intersect b so it's the set that contains only objects that appear in both a and b so in words we use a and b i'm gonna go ahead and get started drawing some diagrams uh venn diagrams are a way to describe set theoretic relationships between uh, different sets. And Venn diagrams, you can construct Venn diagrams for pretty much up to uh, three events. And Venn diagrams make sense. And Venn diagrams are very simple. And the moment you try to go to four events, uh, Venn diagrams become impossible. So we're just going to live in a world where there's only three events. Um, so here's how you kind of draw a Venn diagram, at least for this class. Uh, you draw circles and squares and stuff to denote sets. Often we draw a giant square, and this square denotes the sample space. So the square denotes the universe of possibilities. And we denote a subset of this sample space, otherwise known as an event, with some other shape such as a circle. Or maybe I, there are times where I will draw lines to try to divide it up but basically we're going to draw shapes and lines inside of this sample space that um, divide regions of the sample space from each other and those will denote subsets so often i'm going to draw circles to denote events so i'll often label one circle a and another circle b and uh, how we draw these circles allows us to reason about uh, relationships amongst events so here I have drawn a sample space with two events, A and B, and those events have some outcomes in, in common since there is a region in which both, uh, set, uh, both of these circles intersect. Now there's also a situation where there are outcomes in A that are not in B, so si situations where A happens but B doesn't happen, because you can kind of imagine, if you really wanted a probability model, that we're going to pick a random point from this set and we're going to ask where did this appear did this appear in in a did it appear in b did it appear in a or b um did it appear in a and b or did it not appear in either one um that would almost be a probability model so we can use diagrams such as this to start reasoning about uh set theoretic relationships um and in fact here's something to uh kind of think about well Actually, no, I'm going to save that for the next section. Um, but this is a perfect, perfectly reasonable way to uh, think about uh, set theory at this level. Um, okay, so uh, to, so uh, let's uh, describe the situation uh, A or B. So A union B means an outcome that is either in A or in B um, or both. So what I would do in a Venn diagram is shade the region that corresponds to this event. Um, well, maybe before I do that, maybe before I go into that level of uh, extra complication, uh, how about I first describe the event just A? Well, visually, using a Venn diagram, that what I would do is I would shade the region A and nothing else. And that would correspond to the event where A happens. So I'm using shading of these circles uh, to uh, try and reason about what happens here. Uh, I wonder if there's a... Let's use this highlighter tool. I wonder what ha would happen if I use the highlighter. 
uh it makes my computer lag a lot i'm not going to use that um so um uh, similarly, we could describe another event where we just uh, have B occur. So we'll say the event B. How would we shade this? We're going to shade it like so. Just shade in the region that's enclosed by B and nothing else. So this corresponds. Uh, so this is the region that corresponds to the event B happening. Now, let's go back to some of these other uh, potential relationships, uh, such as A or B, or A union B. Um, hmm, this seems like a fancy feature. No, no, it doesn't work that way. So I need to get rid of that re region. All right, so um, here's a way to draw Venn diagrams uh, when you're trying to do um, uh, stuff. So like, let, let's take, for example, the union operation, A union B, to draw a union operation what i generally will do is i'll take a common color and i will shade in first uh a uh i don't want black i want blue i'll first shade in a the the set on the left side of the union relationship and then i will shade in b the element on the right hand side and a point that was shaded at all is a member of this set so um, so this region that I've kind of enclosed in red uh, corresponds to the set A or B since any point that got shaded by blue at all uh, counts as being a member in this event. Okay, uh, let's draw another uh, event. Let's uh, illustrate, for example, A intersected with B. So to draw intersection, let's uh, first draw our sets A and B. To draw intersection, you're going to subtract points. Uh, you're going to subtract from a, a or, or actually what you would do is, I like to think of it in terms of pieces of paper, uh, where you overlap two paste, pieces of paper on top of each other and then uh, cut the pieces of paper so that only the overlapping region is what's left. So uh, you could imagine here, uh, I draw uh, something on A and I draw something on B. And then I'm going to erase from the picture the region that what that was in B but not in A. And I'm going to erase from the picture the region that is in A but not in B. And what's left is going to be the region that corresponds to A intersected with B. Okay. Um, so another uh, important notion is disjointedness. Two sets are disjoint if they have no elements in common. In that case, A intersected with B is the empty set. So to draw disjointedness, this is what I would do. Here's my sample space. I draw an, an event A and I draw an event B such that there is nothing in common between the two events. All right, I'm going to draw the intersection between these two events. I'm done because there's nothing intersecting. So the intersection between these two events is uh, is uh, the empty set. Um, to uh, so this is one way. If you really wanted to uh, assign some sort of meaning to the empty set, it would be that the empty set is a logical co contradiction in a way, since the empty set shows up and when you have events that have nothing in common, and which are almost logical contradictions. Uh, another notion in probability theory, no, in a set theory, is complementation. How would I illustrate complementation? So let's uh, draw a sample space. I have A, I have B. What is the, so this is um, uh, A intersected with B uh, equals the empty set. That means disjoint. Uh, what is A complement? A complement is the region in the sample space that is in A, that is in the sample space, but it's not an A. So that's going to correspond to shading everything that's outside of A. So there are some parts of B that get, sh that get shaded, but nothing that's in A. Okay, so you shade everything except A. Uh, some other important subset relationships. 
Um, we have uh, uh, or so some other set relationships. Here is the relationship uh, A is a subset of B. What it means for one set to be a subset of another is that um, all of the elements in A are also in present are also present in B. Or alternatively, there is nothing that A that doesn't also exist in B. So a subset relationship looks like so. You have the set B, and the set B contains the, the set A. So you would so draw A as being in the interior of B. Uh, another uh, notion that I haven't really described above, but let's go ahead and mention it, is the notion of set subtraction. We have A subtract the set B. That corresponds to every element in A that is not in B. So... Uh, it, this, it is in fact possible to prove that A subtract B, and you might actually be required to show this in your homework, and the way you'd probably show it is by playing around uh, with Venn diagrams. You can say this is A intersected with um, the complement of B. So A and not B. So what does set subtraction look like as a Venn diagram? We have the set A, we have the set B, and we draw everything in A, uh, and we shade everything in A that is not in B. So you kind of subtract out the set B. It's as if you had these pieces of paper. They put them. You put uh, the piece of paper, uh, the B piece of paper, on top of the A piece of paper, and then you cut out the part of the B of the A piece of paper that's in the B piece of paper. <coughs> <coughs> uh, excuse me. Okay, uh, so let's see an example. Use a Venn diagram to illustrate uh, A or B complement or A and B. Uh, before I continue on, let's just make sure I'm still streaming. I'm still streaming. Um, at some point, I'll relax about that, but today is not that day. Uh, let's get started by just drawing uh, the Venn diagram. Oops, uh, I don't want red yet. So here is my Venn diagram for the sample space S. I have A and I have B. Okay, so I'm first going to illustrate uh, the event A intersected with B. I'm gonna do so in blue. So A intersected B, that's the region that is in both A and B. Uh, as for A or B complement, you have the complement, uh, you have the union of A or B, which is kind of this, uh, uh, figure eight looking region here. And I want everything outside of that region because I want the complement of that region. So I'm going to shade it everything that is outside of that region. And this is what you end up with. Okay, so that's one example. Next example, consider three sets A, B, and C. So how would I draw uh, these in a Venn diagram? I would have my square denoting the universe of possibilities, which is S. And then I draw um, three circles, one for A, one for B, and one for C. So what is the union of A, B, and C? Well, it's going to be the set where uh, if I shade A, everything in A, and then I shade everything that's in B, and then I shade everything that's in C, if the point ever got shaded, it's going to be in that union. All right, next up, we have A intersected with B intersected with C. So let's draw our universe. Here's our sample space. So we have A, B, and C. So let's see, uh, let's take a point right here. This point that I just drew is um, a point that is in B and it is in C, but it is not in A, so it's not going to be in the intersection. Uh, this point right here is in B, but it's in neither A or C. Uh, but it, uh, it's, it's also just not in A, so it's not going to be in the intersection of all three. And you can just start reasoning about all of these points in a similar way. And the conclusion that you're forced to reach is that this little sliver here is the only part that's going to be in all three sets. So that corresponds to the intersection of all three. All right, uh, next example, this is a more complicated one. We have 
A intersected with B, or A intersected with C, or B intersected with C. What is that going to look like? Well, let's get started. Uh, I don't want red. All right, here's our sample space. Here is A, here is B, here is C. All right, let's start out by uh, building this thing up with uh, the intersection A and B. All right, here is A and B, here's A and C, and here's B and C. So this wind or pinwheel looking region uh, is the only region that ever got shaded, so that's going to correspond to the union of the three of the three intersections. So this would, in words, this would be an event where at least two events happen. This would correspond to. All right. Uh, so example eight: describe the intersection, complement, and union of events described in examples one through five. <coughs> uh, let me get caught up. Um, so the point of this section is to go uh, from these pictorial representation, or not this section, this example, is to go from these pictorial representations of events to more algebraic representations. So uh, let's go with example one. So for example one, that was the example where we were flipping a coin, we could get either heads or tails. Uh, we could have uh, the intersection of heads and tails. Uh, uh, of the two uh, sets, heads and tails, these two sets have nothing in common. They are therefore considered disjoint events. So the intersection of these is the empty set, since you would only restrict yourself to what is in common, and they have nothing in common. Uh, whereas the event heads or tails, uh, that event would correspond to uh, the event heads with uh, heads and tails, uh, which corresponds, by the way, to the sample space. Okay, uh, here's also some basic uh, properties for you. Uh, let's let's take an arbitrary uh, set S. No, 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 not S. Uh, let's take an arbitrary event A. A intersected with the sample space is equal to A, since A is a subset of the sample space. In fact, in general, if A is a subset of B, then A intersected with B is going to be uh, A, and A union with B is going to be B. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I want you to think about why that's true. Uh, go Try and reason about it with uh, Venn diagrams. Um, so, and in fact, that's pretty much, that pretty much says everything that I would want to say about uh, the sample space and the empty set, because uh, since A is a subset of the sample space, A intersected with S is going to be A, and A union with S is going to be S. Likewise, A intersect intersected with the empty set, the empty set is a subset of A. Therefore, the intersection of two is going to be the subset, which is going to be the empty set. Uh, on the other hand, a union with the empty set is going to equal A, since A contains the empty set. All right, uh, continuing on with what I was saying before. Um, uh, the next example. Uh, so example two. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, for example, the sets. Um, hmm, uh, my notation in the notes is a little bit different from one I'm sure I wrote down earlier. Um, so let's, uh, uh, hmm. I don't want to go all the way back there. Eh, I'll just, uh, I'll just throw some stuff out. Uh, we could have, um, for example, uh, so mm, this was the one where we were rolling a die. Uh, one, we could say that the union of the set uh, one with the die roll of one and the set with the die roll of, uh, so the intersection of these two sets, this is also going to be the empty set since they have nothing in common, but, uh, the intersection 
of the event with um, uh, no the union of these two sets is going to be uh, is going to be um, the event that contains both of these possible outcomes. Ah. Darn laptop. So one and three. And uh, maybe less trivially, um, uh, we could have uh, we could have the um, event, uh, let's say one, three, five. So this would correspond to an odd number of pips. And we're going to intersect that with the event where the number of pips doesn't exceed three. Um, so that would be the event where you have one, uh, two, and three. Uh, okay. So uh, the intersection of these two events is going to be, well, let's see, what outcomes do they have in common? Uh, one appears in both of them. Uh, three appears in this set, but it doesn't appear in the other one. So let's see, we've got one, uh, one appears in both. Uh, three appears on only one. No, three actually appears in both of them. So three appears in both of them. Five appears only in one and two only appears in one. So whatever got underlined twice, that is going to be in the intersection of the uh, of uh, these two sets. So we're going to end up with the uh, set um, one and three. Now, for a lot of these uh, set relationships, such as and and or, you can kind of think logically using English. Like, for example, um, uh, maybe going to uh, the fourth example where I had uh, sets where, um, yeah, I, I was rolling uh, two dice, uh, a red die and a blue die. You could imagine a set where uh, they sum to seven and the blue dice is at least three. Three, so maybe going to that. So, in the context of example four, so in the context of, oops, in the context of example four, uh, so they sum to seven, uh, and they don't. Or, or no 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 uh, the blue dice uh, so blue dice is um, uh, let's say five so that would correspond to the to the event where uh, you have um, so let's see the blue dice is at least five so we could have the blue dice be five. Ugh, stupid pen. So the blue dice could be five, or the blue dice could be six. And in these two situations, we know what the red dice is going to be. In the first, the red dice is going to be two, and in the second, the red dice is going to be one. So this would be uh, the corresponding uh, resulting event after we do that intersection. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave it at that There's because there's a lot of examples. So for the rest of these, maybe uh, try going through uh, some of the set, the events that I listed down and figuring out if you intersect or complement these events. So intersection, complementation, union, uh, all these things. Try going through those sets and uh, seeing what you get. Okay, uh, but I've given you some examples to start working off of for now. All right, so I'm going to leave that for this section, and uh, I will see you in section two, where we go beyond just uh, talking about some basic set theory and actually start uh, saying what it takes to build a probability model. All right, so I will see you later.